Welcome to today's episode of The Square, a curious conversation with Hossein Razai. Uh, you're noticing it's probably a little darker than normal. That's because Hossein's actually in Singapore and has gotten up early to have this conversation with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, Hossein, you have uh, a laundry list of, of different titles. Uh, you know, you're a teacher, a writer, a researcher, a designer a businessman, but it all kind of comes back to engineering, which is what seems to be your first love. How how did you first fall in love with engineering? Well, well it goes back to um, to my early, early teens, back in the early 70s in Iran. Uh, the country was uh, going to rapid modernization and reconstruction. And you would see at the corner of every street, there were buildings being built, there were roads being built, cities, bridges, dams. And I would look at these sites and the, at that time the construction workers there with, with a degree of fascination, the way they were putting things together, the, the, the way they were made, building things up. Look at the cranes, look at the you know, concrete mixers, the levels, the fuel lights, they were sort of accurately measuring uh, how how one floor was put on top of one another, and they really, I, I wanted to be one of them. They were my they were my heroes. Have sort of remained with me ever since. I even now every every day I go to the office, I'm just like excited about the next tall building or the next new thing, things that we're going to do. That's how it started. Of course, it was uh, before that. I went through the, the phase of like millions of other kids wanting to be a bus driver. Uh, <laughs> Or a pilot, <laughs> but uh, since the early early teens, that um, fascination with engineering uh, has remained with me. So, where is your your passion for design process rooted? Well, the, for the for the process, it, it, it probably stems from the fact that I'm a I'm unapologetically a perfectionist to a, to, to a fault. The good thing about it is that I know it, so I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, to be a perfectionist, you uh, the first thing that you really appreciate uh, deep down is that you will never get, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you will never get to that, to that, to that perfect solution, to that perfect system. It, it is a journey, it is a hope, uh, rather than a wish or a desire, as it were. Um, but in, in order to be as close as possible to that perfect solution, to that perfect world, to that perfect whatever it is, you really need to collaborate. You know, you can't do it on your own. Nobody can build a, we can't build a building on our own. You know, the, the amount of professionals and people that need to collaborate in order to even make a simple building shows that, you know, nothing else can be achieved um, by one profession, by, by one person. Now, in order to collaborate, we need a process. We need to, we need to have the, a process that regulates the relationship between the different different parties, between the different players. And uh, for me, that process is highly driven with what I call purposeful design. It's a design that is not about, it's not vain, it's not about beauty, it's not about aesthetics. Though things can be beautiful and, and aesthetically rich, but it is about uh, achieving a higher purpose. And that is that is the process of design that I've been sort of formulating in my head, learning from from others and adding adding to it and, and sort of the work in progress that we all are. It's it's crazy being what I will call a self aware perfectionist. <laughs> There's um I don't know. It, it seems like so often you hear that people that are perfectionists are the worst people to lead a team, but that's not true in your case. How how do you balance your perfectionism with leading a team that is allows creativity and collaboration? Um, I think, um, I mean, whether, whether it is sort of difficult or not to work, say, with me, for instance, uh, is, is, is sort of a question that um, I would like to to, to hear what my colleagues and people with, with whom I work and the team uh, would say. From my point of view, one of the one of the uh, tricks perhaps is the fact that I do appreciate first that perfection, as, as perfectionist as I think I am, 
Perfection will never be achieved. That before you get close, uh, close enough to what you consider to be a perfect solution or a perfect position to be in, you will have learned and evolved and your, your, what you would be considered to be perfect will have moved away from you. And so it's a, it's a journey that you continuously take. But also in terms of team, uh, in, uh, people tend to attract uh, uh, people with similar interests in, in a professional environment, for instance. I think maybe, maybe I am surrounded by a bunch of by a group of um, perfectionist people who are also perfectionists in, in, in their own way. And they may not, they may not even admit it, unlike myself, who admits it. But um, <laughs> and I think maybe maybe the whole team is is a, is a group of perfectionists. Not everybody who's joined the companies that I've had uh, with me have uh, always stayed with us. Though our retention rate is very very high compared with with with, with the industry average. So. They're maybe doing something right, and that is that maybe these people are also fascinated by perfection. They want to do that as well. Being drained, being going through dry spells, it's just part of the process. But how do you keep yourself inspired? I, I think you know, as as you said, it, I was thinking about it uh, as you were asking the question. Uh, it is a spell. It is by telling yourself that this is a spell. This is a short time. You, you're going to go through this. And, uh, and by appreciating in a way that it, this is actually part of that journey. It is, you know, you will not be free flowing with fantastic ideas and groundbreaking thoughts all the time. Um, and not having, uh, not being in that state and being in this apparent state of dryness is also part of that journey. You're, you're, maybe you're subconsciously uh, rejuvenating, maybe you're re-energizing yourself. So by appreciating that, I think that is, um, that is one, of the, uh, one of the things. The other thing is that you know, this whole idea of uh, creativity and innovation, and so I think that there is a, uh, some have uh, in my opinion, thought perception that creativity happens when you're sitting, I don't know, in a, in a, in a sort of, uh, of off-street cafe and having sipping of your coffee, and suddenly this beautiful <laughs> idea comes, uh, you know, pops into your head, and then you run to the laboratory or run to run to your office and and start sketching. It is not like that. Creativity is a very, very hard work. It is. It requires a lot of discipline. It, it requires a lot of rigor and and and, and hard work. Um, it is an attitude. You want to be creative. You have to want to be creative, and and then 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 you need to acquire the other the other components that that are necessary uh, to in order for you to create something new. Uh, but the um, the, the appreciation that there are times that you will not be as um, creative as others is, is is part of that process. I love that idea of this. There's there's this idea that it thing. It, it, there's it's constant change. Things will always this this too shall pass. And there'll be times when you're you, you're kind of feeling the creative flow, and other times when you're dry, and you just have to learn to kind of roll with it. Do you think that? Everybody has the capacity to be creative. I think, I think, I think everybody is creative. What we lack, uh, or maybe not lack is not the right word, but what, where we are different is in that desire, in that attitude to want to be creative in what area, at what level we want to be creative, etc. Everybody is creating something. We're all designing things, as, as, as people said. You know, you 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 get up in the morning and decide whether you wear a black shirt like I have or a blue shirt like you have, you know, we are, we are designing ourselves. So the question is, you know, what, are, what are these ambitions? So I would say that, you know, the purpose through design and the creativity at a higher level where our work and our design is in the service of a higher purpose. Now, what is that higher purpose? Is it to save the world, to save the planet, or just doing a building? Uh, you know, it depends on where we target, where, where we aim. So. Um, I think every, definitely everybody is creative. Everybody has the aptitude to be uh, to be creative. But also one thing that 
comes to my, my mind is, you know, this is all the, the idea that, you know, the whole process is, uh, is that it, it's your juxtaposition of uh, chaos and order and chaos and order. If it was order, 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 order all the time, you know, the, you know, anybody who's done anything new would tell you, and I'm sure you, you, you know it yourself as well, that it would never happen. Mm-hmm. And if there's always chaos, 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 also nothing interesting and beautiful would come out of that. It is it's that appreciating that there are, there's a period where you really feel highly creative, you feel very effective, you feel that you're doing things, and then if you, you, you step into what appears to be a, um, a, 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 dry, a dry period. And that is it's all part of that chaos and order, chaos and order. It is, Free-flowing and dry spell, free-flowing and dry spell. That this is all part of the whole ecosystem, as it were. It was it was interesting to hear you. While, while I I love the mindset of it, it was interesting to hear you say that that the aesthetic is not necessarily something that's at the forefront. What's forefront is this this higher calling. That said, you have some incredibly aesthetically. Um, gorgeous uh, buildings. Um, I was looking through a, a, a bunch of different ones. It's hard to pick one. I was thinking about the Asia School of Business and the way the shapes and the lines. Tell me a little bit about that project. Well, that, that's a beautiful project that we worked um, on. In, in, it's in Kuala Lumpur. It's for the National National Bank of uh, Malaysia, Bank Negara, in, in a local language. Uh, we worked on, in fact, uh, that, that's where I met Anthony. Uh, he, he was uh, he was the architect on that project. Um, it is um, it is a it's a beautiful building. It's sort of, sort of it's, uh, it's got a central atrium, long building of, of about a hundred meters long, and they sort of curve the linear accommodation space about six or seven stories on either side, with a beautiful um, um, floating sort of roof that sort of um, levitates over over the top. Um, uh, you've got, you know, the, the response is, uh, you know, is to the site and to the context of the site and to the to the light coming. So the curvilinearity of the of the building, it is not sort of some random lines drawn. They say, let's we don't like straight lines. Let's just curve it around. It is it is in order to create that you know, juxtaposition of of, of volumes and, and light coming into the atrium, etc. And that is a that's one of our most beautiful buildings. And it com- was finished recently, I think, uh, 2019 or 20, early 2020. Tell me about some of the projects you're working on now that you're excited about. Well, we have we're, we're fortunate enough to have a number of projects uh, which are on site and also at, at the design stage. Uh, we're doing two of the Expo Pavilion for the for the Dubai uh, World Expo coming up uh, later later this year in October. The Singapore uh, Pavilion, which we're working on with Moha, is nearing completion. The Malaysian Pavilion with Hijaz Architects um, at sort of Kuala Lumpur is also coming to to towards completion. Um, we are. Doing a beautiful stadium, a competition-winning stadium, uh, forty thousand seaters or so, in uh, in downtown Singapore by the marina. Part of it is on land, part of it is on on, on water. Uh, that one is with with more architects again. Uh, we are we've been working for the past two years on um, a, a, another competition-winning scheme with Zong Hadid Architects out of London and Architect Sixty One in Singapore. It is a new science center, uh, uh, a very, very creative uh, way of putting the, 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 the spaces together in a manner that's totally future-proof and every space can be adapted um, very easily going into the future. Uh, that will hopefully go to site early next year. We'll be a bit of designing it. We have a Fantastic uh, high-rise projects. One of the things that we, we do quite a lot of um, in Kuala Lumpur, there are three towers. One is 72 stories, is straight um, straight up and down. But the other two, as they go up, they twist relative to one another. One is 62, the other 158 stories. Uh, Conley, that's with RSB Architects in, uh, in Malaysia, and 
the beauty of this thing again, you know, something like the like the Asian, the Asian School of Business building. These these towers go up, and they twist away from one another, not purely for a for a sort of um, um, for a movement you know, to to just create a form and shape, but they move away from one another, twist away from one another, in order for the people uh, in the units from one tower not to overlook. The, the units in the other tower. So that's like sort of where shape and form and aesthetics are uh, offering more than just uh, pure um, and thin aesthetics. What else are we doing? We're doing a couple of beautiful uh, universities, uh, one in Dhaka with, uh, with Woha, uh, it's on site, uh, it's going to be completed within the next year or so. Uh, Singapore Institute of Technology, another university in Singapore, is, is also on site. Uh, plus a few others that I may not sort of, uh, recall now, but um, some some very interesting genre of projects. Beautiful project with BIG, uh, a competition-winning one uh, in uh, in Malaysia, where we are uh, not reclaiming land, but reconstructing land, what we say, so land creation uh, off, off the coast. Um, I suppose, you know, in every project, we're fortunate enough to work with, uh, you know, with good people who are, you know, like-minded people who don't want just to do buildings, because that is the, the, the product that comes at the end, but, you know, how do we, how is that done, and what, what, what other purposes does that serve, and whether it creates a new set of knowledge, a new set of um, Sort of direction for for the future of that genre of, of project, whether it's engineering or architecture or, or other aspects. So when you when you hear of an RFP or a project comes across your desk um, at the very you know early stages, what is what's the first thing you do? What's the first things you're thinking about in a project? I think um, you know. Well, one of the first things that we do, you know, we we have a, we have a five step. For, for us, a five-step approach to our design. One, one of the things about us engineers and architects alike is that you know, we're very positive people. We, we are very proactive. We want to make things happen. So we start talking. We start doing things. Um, I, I, try to, I try to delay that. With, uh, the thing that I say that I think we should, we should start by listening, not by talking. We start by, by uh, listening. Uh, to the architect, to the developer, to, uh, to, to try and get beyond or behind the, the written document, which is the client's brief, or behind the, behind the mind of the, say, the architects who have drawn something. Uh, say, if we get about these drawings, what is it that you want to do in it? Uh, um, assume in, in a world that doesn't have gravity, it wouldn't have gravity. You wouldn't have to have columns and beams and, and, and this sort of stuff. What is it that, that is the space that you want to create? And that is the ideal position. Of course, we can't do that. Unfortunately, we have to deal with gravity and wind and seismic and things like that. So we try to see how close to that ideal we can get, rather than moving from where we are to where we can. So what, what is that ideal position? Then we, 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 we move away from that and try to stay as close to that as possible. Have you ever given any thought to doing engineering or designing where there isn't gravity? Maybe doing something in space. Yes, we have. We we have. I think that you know the the ideas that um, we've, we've been um, thinking about this, uh, the, 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 you know, living on Mars and, and other places where there are there are less gravity or less gravitational forces. And I not I've been really thinking about how our buildings. Um, how our buildings and our habitats would uh, would look like. Um, we're so uh, enmeshed with um, with uh, with the challenges that we have with, with forces and and, and, and gravitational etc. That our buildings are are highly are highly governed by that. I mean, just, as an engineer, of course, that, that that makes it makes it exciting and interesting. But I just wondered what. Um, what the situation, what the look of the buildings would be uh, in those situations. In a way, we do have it as engineers. Okay, the gravitational forces on the planet Earth are the same wherever we go. But there are other forces that we design buildings for, especially for tall buildings, for instance, is wind. 
and, and wind varies from almost non-existent in some part of the planet to places where we have hurricanes and very high, high wind speeds. So our buildings, our structures by default sort of look different. Um, similarly, with, with seismicity, there are places on the planet where there's no seismicity that sort of latch or load that, that gets applied to the building that the building needs to, needs to resist. Whereas we've done projects in, in, in sites where the, they have the highest seismicity on the planet Earth. So, uh, and, and our buildings and our structures respond to that. The challenge that we've had is that how do you do that without the building necessarily looking uh, robust, being robust, but looking gross and looking intrusive into the space and into the, into the architecture? And we have met with some some degree of success. You know, one of the projects that we did in um, uh, it's, a, it's an Amman resort, Amman era in the Dominican Republic. It's the high the site is highly, highly uh, seismic. It's in the same sort of lump of land where Haiti is, and we, we hear about huge, devastating earthquakes in Haiti uh, regularly, unfortunately. But when you look at the building, you, you, you don't, you don't, you wouldn't think that this is like it's bracing itself so heavily and and, and is sort of looking so different. But the bunker, it is not. So that that that's sort of challenges that we've been dealing with and handling and, and exploring. So shifting gears just a little bit, education is something that is obviously uh, extremely important to you. Um, you've taught and spoken all over the world from, from L.A. to London. Um, you seem to have both a, a, a thirst for learning and for teaching. Why is that? I, I think the reason for it is that, you know, there's a beautiful book. It's uh, uh, sort of uh, very easy to read as well. Uh, so I read a couple of years ago, maybe longer. Uh, called factfulness, and that really articulates this idea that things are changing so fast that our existing knowledge fast gets out of date, outdated. And, and the, 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 the perception, the, the thing that 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 book particularly articulated was uh, something like ask, asking a, a group of even like geography teachers about the geography of Africa. The countries that exist in Africa, and they did not know that some of these guys, in the, their knowledge was ten years older, or some even worse, twenty years older. You know, the whole number of countries, the borders, and, and things have changed. Things are moving so fast, and unless you keep, you know, you, you need to run in order to 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 keep up to the, to stay today to stay steady. And if you want to be ahead of the curve, if you want to be influencing the, the future directions of anything. My case of engineering, design, uh, congruency with the environment. We really need to, to update ourselves. We really need to to read, and you know, uh, of course, try and try and teach that. And 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 uh, I, I've said uh, on numerous occasions that uh, when I go to uh, when I'm invited to judge a competition, for instance, and I look at this uh, myriad of designs and things, I learn more than I. Than I teach um, or go to universities at times. So uh, we, we really need to continuously read, continuously update ourselves, or we fall behind. Um, is is there? I think education can also take the form of educating architects and developers on what is possible. I uh, I'll I'll read this quote that I found um, in an article. Uh, that you were a part of. It said the traditional approach, that this is a quote from you, the traditional approach is that developers or architects set out a problem and everyone else just kind of has to solve it. Um, and it becomes kind of a them and an us paradigm. But he, you, you want to really um, be a part of the initial conversations with architects and developers before the problem is laid out. That You want to get into their minds and find out what they want to do because sometimes they don't know what possibilities exist. Why is the education of architects and designers alike important? Well, it is uh, it, it is key. Uh, thank, thank you for reminding me of that of, of that quote. Yes, I think it is. I mean, uh, educating um, uh, architects and, and and developers and and engineers alike. It might it might sound a little bit um, uh, a little bit patronizing, but I think we are educating each other as we as we talk to each other. You know, it's in that sense. Um, there, uh, 
the complexity of the of the work that we currently do is such that we uh, there's no, no one person, no one profession who can uh, effectively and and uh, in an optimized manner consider all the considerations, all, all the parameters and all the factors, and come up with a with a solution. Uh, this the, the, the old-fashioned approach where uh, the developer sets a challenge and then the architects will convert that into a building and then the engineer makes that stand up and then the MEP engineer makes it um, environmentally responsive, cool and, or warm, etc. in a layered by layered manner is not uh, conducive to, to great buildings, to efficient buildings. Uh, I think the, 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 uh, we should all be, become sort of uh, metaphorically part of the problem in order we should be, that we, we would all be part of, the, part of the solution. So I think it, it, it is in that context that sort of educating each other during the, during the process of design is, uh, is, is, is important. The other thing that I would say, um, sort of a long answer to your beautiful question, is that um, you see, we all bring in different levels of competence, different degrees of competence. I bring in my engineering competence to the to the team. The architect brings in his architectural and client his his, his business aspect and, and whatever, and, and, and so do others. If I continue to speak the, the, the engineering language um, and, and the architect speaks the architectural language, uh, and we don't then fully understand each other. It leads to frustration and to not to really a, a very good collaborative environment. It's like going to the United Nations and everybody speaks their mother tongues, and they're. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I I cite poetry from Hafiz in Iran and, and, and others, and, and they're so beautiful. And I, I I don't get any vibes from others, and I get frustrated. How come you guys don't appreciate? It? I think we need to speak that common language. We need all to be bilingual. And it is in that second language of design that collaboration happens. So if we do that, then then beautiful things happen. And, in, and that is part of that education, that the engineer needs to understand, this is, of course, to have his core competence, but you must understand the language of design, the language of development, so that we can talk to the developer, to the, to the architects, to the to the town planners, to the authorities, so to make sure that what is it, what is their considerations, and how can we then uh, best address them in a manner that we get a good building and you know set uh, set, a, set the standards and raise the bar a little bit for the future. So I I do I I I hear what you're saying, and, and it's not tearing down the silos. It's it's letting people who have the strengths of um, you know, architect and design and engineer and, and all the various people at the table operate in those strings, but it's creating this common language that allows for increased collaboration. Um, I, I did, I read about how you were actually the first engineer to be awarded the designer of the year award by the Singapore president. What, what was that like and how does that play into this idea of, of um, kind of crossing boundaries? I think that was that was a that was a very uh, positive moment. Definitely in my in my uh, you know career, but also in the progression from uh, from a professional point of view, where you know engineering being uh, officially recognised as a design discipline. You know, they, they, there is this old-fashioned perception that engineers just do calculations. It is about numbers. Now, of course, that is true, but that is not the only thing. We do numbers and we do calculations in order to verify what, uh, what we design and what we create in terms of, in my case, structures and in other, in other engineering disciplines, other things. So I think that, that was quite important, that, that engineering is actually a design discipline and, and an engineer then competes with other um, professionals from other design disciplines and in the in, in this case, fortunately, he you know he, he gets the award. So that was a sort of um, a milestone for me and, and for the profession. Definitely, definitely in this part of the world, where um, sometimes um, uh, the engineers are seen as 
at best just enablers that you know I, I have an idea you, you just make it happen for me but uh, but that we can contribute to the betterment of some some design and some ideas was uh, something that that came out of that that experience I, I I know when we were talking earlier you mentioned and as, as we think about design um, that you think um, we are too people centric um, I'm curious what you mean by that. I think, you see, uh, sometimes we, we take words and, and ideas out of the context in which they were, they were created. And gradually over time, we, we use and overuse it to the point that it loses its, um, its originally intended uh, meaning. For instance, I mean, sustainability is one of them. People centric is another one. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we've talked about sustainability a little bit. But uh, people centric design is good as opposed to a uh, sort of whimsical author architect oriented design where, where we design for ourselves, not for anybody else. But that, that, you know, people, designing for people is better than designing for our own whims. Designing for people, designing cities for people, is better than designing um, cities for cars. So people-centric is better than car-centric. But then taking this out of that comparative context and talking about people-centric as if that is the ultimate goal, gets to a point where everything that we're doing, we're doing for people. And people are only one species on this planet. And if you're being highly, highly biased against millions of other uh, other species who have, in my opinion, have the same rights to 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 living, to livelihood on this planet as we do, ignoring all of those in favor of only one species in uh, and, and being people centric with our design, with our cities, with our everything, turns that whole dynamic uh, on, on its head. People something which is supposed to be good as opposed to something which is even worse suddenly becomes a bad thing because we end up where we are. The challenges that we have with our planet, the challenges that we have with, with the loss of biodiversity are partly coming because from the fact that we've been too people-centric. And it is in that context that I think people-centric is no good, planet-centric good. You know, we should be looking at a... a, a, a planet for all species as opposed to a place for all people, which is a, uh, which is a beautiful, uh, beautiful mantra that, that, that we've had for the past you know, 50, 60, 70 years. It is in that context that I, I challenge uh, the term people say. Well, and you mentioned the word sustainability, and I, I know that designers um, and engineers alike have kind of a love-hate relationship with it. Um, you know, hate in the in the sense that it has perhaps been overused and lost some of its impact, maybe even lost some of its way. Um, but love in the fact that there is this deep uh, desire to be a good global citizen, to be a, a species that thinks of other species, to use your words. How do you think the the human and the natural systems are interrelated? Well, I think... Uh, I think, as you rightly said, you know that, that love-hate relationship with, with the word sustainability. It, it, it probably comes from the fact that uh, most of us love the the ethos for which the word sustainability stands for, but we hate the fact that the, the word sustainability is not doing what we uh, what we intended to do now. Sustainability uh, as, as, an, as an attitude towards work, as, a, as an attitude towards the environment, was good 50, 60 years ago. Is no longer good enough. We need to be a lot more than that. And I, I probably mentioned this to you last time we spoke that, you know, the example of that, that I think it was given by a dear friend, Michael Pauling, who was one of the initiators of the construction declares movement in the UK. In one of his talk, he said something to this effect, that if you ask your your, your closest friend um, intimately that, buddy, how are you doing with your with the marriage, with the wife? And he says, well, it is sustainable. You wouldn't think it is great. <laughs> it's just bad, it's just bad works. 
how sustainability in the in, in our industry, in, in, in our attitude towards the world sustainability, in our attitude towards the environment, wants to be um, that greatest thing that, that has ever happened to, 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 to mankind and to the planet, is it brings that, that sort of hate relationship. It is not enough. Sustainability as in damaging enough that can be repaired was okay 50, 60 years ago. It's no longer good enough. We need to, to do no damage. We need to do full repair. So that, that is why we need to move away from that, that um, the word, which is no longer um, uh, carrying the ethos that, that, that it has, to words like regenerative design, to words like environmentally responsive design, congruency with the environment. You know, the word, the, the, this is the vocabulary, this is the sort of lexicon of, of the environmental um, people now. It ought to be rather than sustainability, which is not, not good enough. So you, you've, you founded Web Structures, um, your, your company. It, does, does the idea of sustainability and even, even the, the revised idea of people-centric, does that play into why you found Web Structures? Well, to, to some extent, to, to a large extent, that was the reason. You know, I, I had certain ideas, some, um, um, some of which I still hold, some I have changed and, and, and evolved as I've learned, learned more back in, back in 1996. And I really wanted to see uh, how they would, uh, they would respond in practice, how they would work. I had my ideas about what, what an engineering consultancy should be doing what is the role of, a, of, of the of the engineer in in, in the ecosystem of, of, of development and not all of it totally coincided with the traditional role that were assigned to to engineers etc so i wanted to 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 to, to practice it and to, to see how and to and to develop it um, and that, that was that was one of the reasons i i, I started web structures and I, I started with no partner as well, which is a little bit unusual, makes, makes life a lot more difficult at times. You're on, you know, on your own. Usually two partners of like-minded people get together and start or something like that. So that, that helps. You have some trusted sounding board. Uh, but um, but that, that, was, that was the main reason I, I started it in order to, to practice it. And we sort of, in a way, you know, obsessively and single-mindedly practice those those ideas some of which we had to, to adjust as we as we learned but a, a big big chunk of it remains what is the ethos of, of, of the company now and um, since the beginning of last year where we have become as the web structures we've become part of a, a larger um, organization um, ramble we are um, uh, trying to uh, influence the, the the design processes within that within this larger setup, and we met with some uh, encouraging degrees of, of success. So what we're finding out is that uh, the, the sort of processes that we had developed, for which was applicable to a practice of about 120 people, is actually scalable to much larger practices. Um, so that is quite encouraging. And, and web structures almost didn't come into being. You, you, what you were telling me uh, just a, a week or so after you, or a month or so after you had started web structures, you had gotten a job opportunity where, if had you gotten that before you decided to start web structures, it might not have happened. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, these, these sort of, um, to some people, accidents, to some people, coincidence. To me, Synchronicity is is, is mm -hmm. important. There is, there is something that that um, that helps uh, helps things happen. Of course, attitude, hard work, and all those things that I mentioned earlier are, sure. are important. Yes, I mean back in I was I just turned forty, I had two kids, um, and I was in Singapore for like about two years, and I knew like three or four people. I had no right to set up a new company <laughs> in this new place that I didn't have any roots in. And I, having done that, I had no rights to, to succeed. But, you know, if, you, if one, I suppose, has um, something to offer and, and there is a, at the right time and right place, things happen. Yes, 
maybe I would not have started if um, if at that time some I, I, I received um, I was approached by by, by some other people. Uh, but definitely it is something that in my mind, wherever I, I would have gone, I would have wanted to have the freedom For to sure. be uh, experimenting, exploring these ideas. Uh, as it ha- happened, I, you know, I did it with web. And you're right, you're, a month into setting up web structures up, I, you know, I was approached um, and uh, with, a, with a very, very um, enticing offer. But I, I decided that I would started something that you know, and I would like to, to finish it. I'm glad you decided to, to go ahead and see it through. <laughs> Me, too. Me too. It's been hard. It's been hard. At times, it, it looked almost impossible, but uh, but it is it's something I would do again if I would put back in that position and knowing everything that happened throughout. So as we kind of wrap up, I'm curious with the advantages that technology. You know, normally we talk about what would happen. You know, what's what's the future look like? Um, but particularly in engineering, with with iterative design, with computational design, how do you see those types of technologies affecting the future of engineering? Totally and fundamentally, the impact is not superficial. Those of us who see the impact of technology or integrating technology into our processes only in the way that we draw things, in the way that we render things, in the way that we present things, we are really not even scratching the surface. Technology and, and the way machines, uh, hardware and, and, and software have, have progressed, have made our relationship with these, with these tools, which I, I, I don't even think are tools anymore, but for lack of a better word, our relationship with these, completely different to the traditional relationship we've always had with with our tools, where we would tell the tool to do something, whether it is a chisel and a hammer in, onto a stone, we would sort of tell the chisel to go down by so much, you would, you would sort of go into the stone by that, or a mouse that you would click and say, well, tell, draw this line. That was a one-way relationship. We would instruct the tool to do something, and the tool would do that. Our relationship with with looking at uh, advanced computational design, the generative um, programs and, and tools that have become available to us is completely different. We are now collaborating with one another. We bounce ideas off one another. We give well, through through script, as you know, through scripts. We we give our preferences, we give our values, we give our required our desires about the design, whether it's a structure, architecture, or a city, to the machine. And then we tell the machine, okay, can you now put these things together and, and let's have a look to see what it looks like. And it does it. And it says, well, it looks like this. Uh, but then in its own language, it, tells, it turns around and says, you know what? I know what, you, what, what your desires are from what you've told me. Yeah? And I've given you seven or eight options that you've asked me to develop. But I've got a few more options. Would you like to see them in their own language? You say, yes, how many do you have? So I've got 50,000 other options <laughs> <laughs> that address the same parameters that you said. The, the relationship between spaces, relationship between columns and beams, depending on what, 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 what the profession is. And then you say, well, I can't look at 50,000. This is the dialogue that we have with the machine. I can't look at 50,000 options. How can I choose these? So, okay, well, I will process them for you. You just give me another desire. So, okay, I like the color blue. So, okay, I I remove all the others which don't have the color blue in them, and I've reduced 50,000 to 8,000. So, well, 8,000, I still can't process it. So, okay, give me another design. Make it more difficult for me. Just want more. You know, and that is the thing. Uh, When I think the late Zaha Hadid said on something that some of these programs have made us think of things that we would not even have thought about before these machines were available. So it is not only about them doing things for us. They have emancipated our brains and our, our minds. And that is what we're doing. If we can uh, collaborate with, uh, with, with the programs, if we can understand them, and if we can work with them. And I think definitely that is, that is where the future lies. Collaboration with the, with the machine uh, at a level that we could not even collaborate with our with our colleagues 
Of course, collaboration with our colleagues remain an indispensable part of our work, but whatever the machine can do, we must let the machine do. And that is not going to make us unemployed. <laughs> it's not, machines are not going to take our yeah. work. We have never had more machines in the history of mankind, and we've never had more people in employment in the history of mankind. So the two are not binary. Well, this has been an incredible conversation. Thank you so much for getting up early and uh, spending a little bit of time with us. Um, I'm I'm really excited to see where, particularly with iterative design and, and computational design, I love the idea of it being something that really it doesn't it doesn't keep us from thinking, and in fact, it challenges us to think more. Thank you for watching this week's episode of The Square. If you'd like to learn more about Hossein or web structures or some of the things that we talked about, make sure to check out the description below and tune in next week for The Square.